G'day fools, Scott Phillips here. A couple of weeks ago, I sat down with Gemma Dale from NAB Trade to talk about how to build a market beating portfolio. Now, of course, I can't promise you it'll be market beating, but we talked about a whole range of things, including companies to include and exclude, even assets to include and exclude, in my humble opinion, of course, if you are aiming to try to build a market beating portfolio. Well, the good people at NAB Trade have shared that video with us and I get to share it with you. So with no further ado, enjoy. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, it's a lovely Tuesday morning. I have to apologize right at the beginning. I've got a bit of a rough voice, which is not what anyone wants to hear in COVID season. <laughs> We're in Sydney. Um, I'm hoping things are okay. Well, Scott's got to sit next to me, but I'll be, uh, I'll be pretty quiet through this session because I know that you are here to hear from him. And, uh, and it's a great opportunity for you to ask all of the questions that we know have been building up over the last 12 to 18 months in a really complex and interesting market. Mm -hmm. People trying to work out how to build a real market beating portfolio. So thank you so much for joining us. If you have any friends or other people you know who aren't able to join right now, or if you're having trouble, we've had an enormous number of registrations for this session. So far more than we would ordinarily get. We are limited at 500. We didn't uh, lock anyone out because often we have people who can't make it on the day. If you have any trouble, we will have a recording of this session and send it out, but we'll probably also talk about doing a subsequent session for anyone who wasn't able to make it. So uh, apologies, a little bit too popular today. <laughs> so a nice problem to have though, isn't it? It could be a lot worse. It could. So, a couple of things to note. Uh, this is an interactive session, so you can see us on video at the moment. If we just go to the next slide, I'll run through the quick disclaimer, uh, letting you all know that we don't know your personal situation. Um, we're thrilled that you're asking questions and hopefully we can help. Uh, and Scott will be doing 99% of the helping. But uh, obviously, if you do need financial advice, please do go and seek it. Uh, and we're not a tax advisor or any of those other things as well. So what we're going to talk about today, we have Scott Phillips with us, who is the Chief Investment Officer of The Motley Fool. And mm -hmm. the first question I'm going to ask him is <laughs> how he got to be that. So we won't talk too much about it. Uh, and I'm here from NAB Trade. And what we're going to be discussing today is what does it take to build a market beating portfolio? I mean, let's start with a portfolio, but then we'll go to market beating because that's terribly <laughs> exciting and much more that's fun. That's the idea, exactly. What to look for in a share investment what Scott's been learning all of these years doing this because it, uh, it's been a really interesting 12 to 18 months, right? Anyone who's come to market recently has had a very, very interesting experience. Uh, and those of us who's been doing it a little bit longer may not have had the same experience, mm -hmm. right? I envy those of you who started in April and May last year <laughs> and how to transition from a few small wins because we are getting a lot of questions at the moment from investors going, I bought... Uh, after pay last mm -hmm. year, or I bought whatever it is that I bought at the bottom or relatively close to it. I've done incredibly well, but now I don't know what to do. Yeah. So let's talk about how we can help you with that. We've got a whole lot of pre-submitted questions and some things I wanted to ask Scott as well, but there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you wish to ask us any questions, please, please put your questions in there. So when you see me going off to the side, I apologize. It looks like I'm not paying attention. I'm actually just filtering questions to make sure that we get onto everything that you guys have asked. So please submit your questions. We'd love to hear what you want to know and, uh, and make this as interactive as possible. Any of you who've seen Scott in action before know that he can kind of work on the fly. Um, I'll do my best. I'll do my best. So thanks so much for joining us and we'll uh, kick off. Let's do it. So Scott, talk to me about how you became a chief investment officer. It sounds so yeah. fancy. Yeah, doesn't it? It sounds impressive. It's really good. You know what? I haven't got a business card. We don't do business cards anymore. So I can't even show you a business card with it on there, but it really, I really am the chief investment officer, I promise. Um, a long and weird story. So I worked in business. Um, mm -hmm. I worked in a whole lot of sales roles, then analytical roles, then finance roles. And there's, a, there's kind of a Warren Buffett quote, that he's a better businessman because he's an investor and a better investor because he's a businessman. And I think for me, that's actually kind of true. The job I was doing in kind of industry was the kind of finance strategy, uh, decision-making idea generation for a sales and marketing team. And so by the time you've done that for a dozen years, you kind of realize that what you've done is kind of worked in the very kind of engine room of business. So when you start to look at it from the outside rather than the inside, most of those lessons come through. So that was the first thing. Um, and then a really weird set of sliding doors. So I uh, read a very short article on Facebook a dozen years ago, literally a dozen years ago, from our CEO, global CEO, saying that the fool was going to do international expansion at some point. Do you want to explain to people what the fool is? Because I yeah, suspect if you don't know what the fool is, <laughs> you will be going, 
Why would you want to work for a fool? It doesn't yeah, sound it's kind of ideal. That. No, it's, mm. not. it's one of those names. No one forgets it. Mm. Can I tell you that if I had a dollar for every time someone said, ah, oh, fool, you guys are fools. Like, oh, we get it, we get it. <laughs> so the, Mot the Motley Fool is a Shakespearean character. Okay. And in the Shakespearean language, in As You Like It, one of Shakespeare's plays, the Motley Fool is the multicolored court jester. So that's where it comes from. And the fool or the jester was the only person who could tell the king the truth without losing his head, right? So because he could, he would do the plays in the court and he would tell stories, allegories that the king could kind of understand. He could kind of tell the truth without actually saying to the king, hey, dude, you're wrong, you know. So that was where the name comes from all that way back. One of those things stands out. Like no one, no one's, if we were, if we were TMF Securities, we'd be one of many. It'd be easier because when you call it a company conference call and you say, I'm from the Motley Fool, I say, I'm sorry, where? <laughs> tell them again, they say, can you spell that? You do, and they say, let me just check that. So there is, you know, it can take a while to get through the right people sometimes. Mm. That's where it comes from. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, I said, so Facebook article, Motley Fool CEO saying we might expand internationally. On spec, out of character, I emailed him directly. Say, hey, I hear you're going to expand internationally. If you ever come to Australia, I don't even know what I want to do. I love my job. But if something comes up, I'd love to be involved somehow. Wait, so you'd never been an equities analyst? Nope. You'd, no? Nope, nope, you nope, just nope. worked in business and yep. went... I'll have a crack at this. So it turns out, well, so, and I wasn't chief investment officer straight away, don't get me okay, wrong. Fair so, uh, so anyway, so literally two days later, I get, a, I get an email from my now boss uh, who says, funny you should say that, we're opening Australia in a month's time. Do you want to come and have a chat? And so we said, I said, great. I said, what can you do? I said, well, I've done sales and marketing and strategy. He said, well, can you write? I said, I don't know. He said, do you want to have a go? I said, okay, sure. So I started being a freelance writer for The Motley Fool. Mm -hmm. Then I started being, as an analyst for The Motley Fool. Then I was director of research. Now I'm 11 years later, I'm a chief investment officer. Yeah, right. So that's how you do it. Very okay. unconventional. It's not something that I would recommend for most people. <laughs> it's sliding doors, right place, right time. Got yeah. very lucky. I feel like sliding doors is also an analogy that's only going to talk to people at a certain age. <laughs> <laughs> who, was the, who was in the movie? Do you remember? Gwyneth Paltrow. There you go. Of course I remember. She had great hair. She did. Yes, <laughs> I like it. No, yeah, yeah. Like you're rocking it. Late 90s. Yeah. All yeah. women went out and got that haircut. So it's very go. memorable. Right. But for anyone who's a bit younger and has no idea what you're talking about it's a Gwyneth Paltrow movie and she anyway she goes through a couple of sliding doors and lives two different different lives had things happy. been different I would be in a different place had I not sent that email yes I don't know where I'd be right now I did send the email here I am here we are okay so let's get we're getting heaps of questions which Brilliant. is wonderful um let's have a look as Gemma said she might be looking off the side of I am I'm so actually, sorry it looks may so also rude. be playing solitaire we're not really sure <laughs> it's um so let's start let's start with a really simple one excellent they Actually, here we go. Ones. This is the first question I was going to ask. Okay. So we've talked about building a market beating portfolio yes. and someone uh, has asked, an anonymous viewer, excellent, mm. uh, as a starting investor, why would I not buy ETFs? And this is the question I was mm -hmm. going to ask you, which is you buy an ETF and yep. I personally think ETFs are extraordinary. When you and I both started doing this, they yeah. didn't exist. Correct. So if you wanted to get, you would be told how you were doing relative to mm -hmm. the benchmark. Mm -hmm. But getting you couldn't the buy benchmark right. yep, was exactly. buying two hundred stocks in quite <laughs> extraordinary <laughs> proportion. Right. Like it was That's right. basically you couldn't impossible. do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you could go and buy an index fund, but mm -hmm. it wasn't listed, mm -hmm. and then anyway, the tracking was right, hopeless and quite difficult. Right. So, ETFs, amazing things. Yes. But you get the ASX two hundred minus a little bit because yep. you're paying fees. It's only a little bit. That's your not market beating portfolio. Correct. But it's. Very close to a market portfolio, mm -hmm. and that's kind of good. Yep. So, anonymous viewer has said, <laughs> uh, "Why would I not just buy ETFs rather than individual shares?" And uh, ETF returns question mark, which I think means. Yeah. So this was another question I was going to ask. <laughs> what kind of return yep. can we expect over the long run right. from the share market? Yes. And I assume you'll talk Australia and international. All right, let's break all that down. Mm. Um, why to buy an ETF? Go for it. <laughs> come on, come on, ETF. Now, if, if you don't if you don't want to, if you're here you're probably here because you want to pick stocks and you want to beat the market right mm -hmm. if you don't want to beat the market great buy the market mm -hmm. you know what don't go and lose to the market so if you don't want to beat the market you can't beat the market you're not cut out to beat the market buy an mm -hmm. etf yeah. go fishing go shopping go and play in the park go and do whatever you want to do so ETFs mm -hmm. are wonderful right if you want the market return buy an etf if mm -hmm. you want to try and do better than the market then you've got to pick individual stocks and so why wouldn't you buy an etf because I think most people think it's possible to at least try to beat the market and get a better return. And we know the amazing power of compounding. Mm -hmm. If you can beat the market by even one percentage point a year over an extended period of time, you'll multiply the returns you would get otherwise from the market. So it is absolutely, in my view, worth trying if you're the sort of person who's cut out for it. So mm -hmm. why wouldn't you? If, if you're asking the question, maybe you're the right person who should buy an ETF. That's completely great. Love it. Buy lots of ETFs on the market, plenty of options out there. But if you want to try and beat the market, then you can't do it with an ETF almost by definition. 
So that's yes. the answer. Where's the market going? No one knows. I don't know. You don't know. No one knows. Mm -hmm. um, I have a I have a favorite line, which is people who uh, make predictions are either lying to you or lying to themselves or both. Because uh, you can't do it. It's not possible to know, right? You can't. We know. all learned that with COVID, right? Didn't we right. all no. learn? No, that's whatever the thing. we thought was going to happen in 2020. That's not what happened. They said we didn't know, right? Mm. Give it, give it 12 months, mm -hmm. and we'll be back in the prediction game, right? And if think about how many experts you listened to at the beginning of last year, who were badly wrong by the end of the year, right? And if you if you got it wrong, why are you doing it? Sorry, I'm just laughing because I'm on. pretty sure I was asked by a major newspaper <laughs> to give a prediction as to where the ASX 200 would end up. Yep, yep. And I think I was correct because hey, well I thought it would fall by about 10%. <laughs> what I didn't nice. predict, sorry, I have to go back and look. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I didn't know, uh, can we get this laptop plugged in, please? Um, what I didn't know was <laughs> that it was going to fall by 30% and then bounce back again and then get through. Nice. So just give us two seconds. We've just realised we're a little bit low on battery we'll be power. Right. We'll get there. Really important to fix before we'll we go keep, any we'll keep, we'll keep pushing through. We'll keep pushing through. If it goes we'll, blank, we'll dial back we'll in. Move to another, we'll move to another screen. We've got a few happening. We do we had a lot of screens. So um, well done, by the way. Nice humble break. Well, no, oh, sorry. It's hilarious. I haven't even noticed until now. And then I was like, I was so wrong for so many reasons. <laughs> right, right, right. But Except correct you in right. the end, right. if I was correct with my principles, I yeah, would have been yeah. way off. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes. Exactly. <laughs> if, you, if, you put the, if you put the reasoning down rather than the result, exactly. Yeah. So you can't predict. No one should try. But what we do know is the market over the really, really long term, that's about 10% a year. Yes. Now, it depends what index you choose, what country, all that stuff matters. But over, by the way, over 106 years, a Credit Suisse report recently said Australia was the number one market since 1900, I want to say, something like that. I know, that's not by amazing. much, not by much, but a little bit. So there you go. Yeah. It's worth investing but in the ASX. We will take We will right? take, absolutely, we'll take it. Um, so about 10%, give or take. Now, that's over the really long term. There's nothing to my mind, to suggest it won't continue to be the case. The, there'll be cycles, right? There will be there'll be high rates, low rates, there'll be uh, recessions and booms. That's, I mean, think about the last 100 years of history, right? A mm. couple of world, 105 years, a couple of world wars, a uh, couple of recessions, a couple of pandemics mm. now, um, and yet roughly 10% despite all that, right? Mm. So I think you'd probably be brave to suggest it's going to be different just because you know, history tends to rhyme if not repeat so i think that's what you'll probably get here and in the u.s i actually think if i was a betting man mm. i think the u.s might actually outperform australia a little bit mm -hmm. um but that back to ets is why you can build your portfolio including some international exposure yeah fair enough uh so one thing on that issue of being able to beat the market mm -hmm. so when i was at uni like my entire thesis was on whether or not oh, nice. fund managers could beat the index there you go. and so i came out of that experience that i looked at four different 400 different uh funds that were held in lots of different ways and fees mm. were the biggest thing yes. so you could take the same fund manager mm -hmm. through a different platform and your fees were much higher you're paying administrative fees for not much of anything really mm -hmm and end up with a vastly worse return. But out of the period that I looked at, which was 12 years, mm. there was one fund manager that outperformed. The thing that I've learned subsequently though, is that fund managers are constrained in a way that individuals are not. Mm -hmm. They have to manage flows from lots of different yes. people and yes. lots of different things. They have to manage for 30 June in a way mm -hmm. that individuals don't. There's a lot yeah. of complexity with being a fund manager. Yes. That you don't have as an individual, you can do whatever you want, right? Uh, tax rates are different. The treatment mm -hmm. is very mm -hmm. different. So even though the research tells us that it's extremely difficult to beat the benchmark, yep. Yep. that is true, I think, more so for professionals than individuals. Yeah, there's certainly got more constraints and it makes it, uh, look, you know, I don't. I think. I think there's a very good reason to say most funds won't beat the market. So you probably should be very wary of investing in funds. Yes. At the same time, you can also say I don't envy the fund managers having those constraints, as you rightly point out. And that's absolutely yeah. true. Um, and fees are the biggest determinant, mm. right? Through, like everything from superannuation through individual investing through everything else, fees are generally the largest determinant at, at scale. Mm. The thing that's also true though is, by the way, averages are averages. And so if you take every fund manager, mm. every fund manager by definition is going to effectively be the average because yeah. they are the market, right? Yeah. And so there'll be outperformers and underperformers. So if you say, what does the average fund manager do? Well, mm. it's like saying, what does the average investor do? And the answer is the average. That's yeah. the point. So if you're going to try and beat the market, you by the way, someone will lose if you win. That's mm -hmm. kind of the nature of the beast. Um, but you can actually outperform because other people will underperform. Mm. If you find the stocks that they don't value, that you think are worth more, that's exactly how you do it, right? So that's why it's worth looking a little bit below the averages. I said ETFs, great. Market average is great. Mm. But the average is made up of unders and overs. That's yes. how you get an average in the first place. And so there's no reason why we can't, as individuals, be above average while others are below. So talk to me about how you find 
the things that you believe are going to be the odors? Oh, man, that is the ultimate question, right? Um, <laughs> I should have saved this one for the end. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Very exciting. <laughs> I could just say that I don't know, and then Gemma's going to freak out. Um, <laughs> Which killed me. Don't ask me. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Drive through the computer and shut yeah. the laptop. Um, there is no easy answer because, so if I look at Shared Advisor, the service I've run for almost 10 years now, nine and a half years, we've gone to everything from bounce back stocks at nine entertainment, for example, through to corporate travel, which was a tiny business eight years ago that's gone through the roof since, even despite COVID. Um, it, there's no one There's no one way. I guess my first thing would be, there is no formula, right? If there was a formula, everyone would do it. If everyone did it, then the returns would go to average by definition. So it's kind of one of those, yeah. you know, it's almost, it's almost self, self kind of defining. It, you know, you can't have a single formula that everyone does, otherwise it wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking for me, I'm looking for businesses that have sound fundamentals. And I mentioned at the top, my business background and, and my investing background, Pattern recognition is super, super valuable, right? Whether that's in, in biology or in finance, if you can look at the things that happen regularly that are common to businesses that tend to succeed, you're in a pretty good place. And that's everything from, you know, a reasonable balance sheet, right? Not too much debt. But even more importantly, maybe more interestingly, businesses that have meaningful growth, businesses that are, I like to use the phrase, more relevant to more customers more often. If you've got a growing business that is simply satisfying more customers that more people are coming to regularly, that's a pretty good sign you're on a, on a good business. Also, don't be afraid to, to ignore or um, look past what the rest of the market is saying. So they can be businesses that are either expensive but justifiably expensive. Look at zero. It's gone from 10 to 40 to 100 to 130 bucks recently. On the flip side, businesses that other people have ignored or, or have thrown out with the bathwater, like some of the COVID stocks, right? Mm. Think about the, the afterpays, the, the travel stocks, the retail stocks in March, April, May. There was some expectation all of a sudden somehow that these things were being left for dead. Mm. And that just simply wasn't ever going to be the case in my view. Mm. And so sometimes it's being a little bit, not contrarian for the sake of it, but if you can find an opportunity where someone simply is overlooking a stock saying, not going to work, mm. then, then it's worth having a look at. Probably the last thing for me is just thinking about where the market is um, changing to, to really take into account or otherwise the, the changing nature of business. So think about a, a, a big structural shift, like in mm. Amazon, for example, I own shares in Amazon. Mm. It has been a 20 plus year winner mm. and it just kept going, right? And so traditional valuation said, we can't possibly get any bigger. It can't possibly yeah. be worth that much, right? And that was true at 100 or 500 or 1,000 or $3,000 yeah. because it simply was just continuing to grind and grind and grind and grind and grind. So letting winners do their thing is also another really important thing, right? Just just don't cut, don't leave too early. Don't cut out too early. Run with it and go, go with the idea. I think for so many of this, that is a really a tricky one it is it i really find is. it really hard to yep. let winners run yes. because i'm yes. like it can't get any bigger <laughs> and yep. the thing that i find really interesting about this i'm sure many people will have the same experience mm. this idea of exponential growth yeah super super important is you're not taught this in fundamental no. valuation fundamental valuation you're taught like there's a limit to everything yes, yes. with the internet and yep. i'm sure with many other things yeah. i'm sure people yeah. will tell me they are in many other areas there really isn't, right? <laughs> yeah, the limits right. are very, very different. Yeah. And, and it's been quite interesting to, yeah. to realise mm -hmm. that maybe the limits are much, much more expansive totally. than we realise. So that was, that's one I personally yeah. have yeah. a lot of trouble no, with. No, you're right. Mathematically, biological. Mm. Humans aren't evolved to think exponentially. We just don't. We can't, right? There's mm. no... I mean, plants kind of grow exponentially a little bit if you kind of think about it, but but realistically, other than that, you know, the kind of the, the pea plant, there's one leaf, then there's two, then there's four, then that's how the kind of plants grow. Yeah. So there is some evidence in nature, but mm. we're just not geared to it. Mm. And so to your point about fundamental valuation, this is, I saw, so discounted cash flows and that kind of stuff, I'm not going to get what promise I'm going to get <laughs> geeky algebra on a, on a webinar. Mm. It's a really, really useful um, experience to have and skill to learn. Because you get a sense of the component parts of what makes up a share price or a business valuation. But I'll take Amazon, right? Amazon's been going 30% or 20% plus for 25 years. There's not a single analyst alive, a really serious analyst, a, mm. a person who's got a job as an analyst, mm. who could have put 20% growth in for 25 years yeah. in a DCF. You, you say, okay, well, maybe it's 25% this year. Yes. And next year, maybe it's 15, then it's 10, then it's yeah. 5. And then in five years, someone will go up 4% a year. Right? What are you supposed to? And, and kind of, I talk about career risk. Can you imagine going to your boss and say, hey, I've got this DCS. It's going to grow forever. My, my, yeah. my $9 Amazon stock right now, I think it's going to be worth $3,000 in 2021. Yeah. Okay, boss. And the boss is going to look at you. Are you what, idiot? Yeah, yeah. What, what do you want? <laughs> like, seriously? And and it's just because and, you run the risk of also, look, can you imagine putting that out? Not only would your boss have said you were silly, you would have been ridiculed widely across the market by everyone mm. who did it. And your point, the internet, 
globalization, mm. all these things, the disruption generally yeah. has just made this such a different game to play. It's really, really important to think about that effect. Mm. So one thing that is quite interesting on that front, geography. Yeah. Do you remember when we always talked about this is the geography for a stock? Like this mm -hmm. is, so one thing that um, a couple of investors I know get really frustrated by, and, mm. and I don't know if you talk about total addressable market. Yes, yes. And now total addressable market is 8 billion people. Yeah, that, yeah, like, yeah, like yeah. I literally, my total addressable market for my company mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. all people. <laughs> um, yeah. But back in the day, mm -hmm. it was the opposite. Yeah, it was yeah. kind of like my total addressable market is uh, people who live in this suburb or whatever it might totally, be. So totally. those things seem to have changed yeah. a great deal. I'm yeah. going to look to another couple of questions. Ever quick Interestingly, ETF, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll so, oh, one question is how safe are ETFs? That's an there we go. I like that. Mm. Um, just quickly on addressable market. So mm. you're right, it was neighbourhood, then it was mm. city, then it yeah. was country. Now, I've got to say, there is there is now a natural, I mean, short of colonising the rest of the universe or discovering alien species, 8 billion is as big as it gets now. We are, this might well be the last great leap of industrialization and globalization. So that's really big and really important. And it's worth being mindful of. I think about how long it took Coca-Cola, for example, to colonise the Eastern European countries, mm. for example, or even most of the West, we're talking decades and decades and decades. How long did it take Facebook or Twitter mm. or Google? Mm. Literally single digit years, yeah. because they're moving at the speed of technology, the speed of the internet, and it's a remarkable change. By the way, that also tells you that it can get bigger than you expect, mm. it can grow faster than you expect. And also there is a trade-off between the safety of how can I make sure I don't lose money, mm. but also how do I make sure I'm early enough yeah. Because those things get priced in really fast these days. And so, the, 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 you know, if you bought Coke in 1930, well, 1940, 1960, it didn't really matter you made money all the way through. Mm. These days, if you buy Facebook in year one versus year five, yeah. your returns are probably going to be 10 times the size. Like it's literally that big and that fast. So, not is it exponential, but it's mm. super fast. Yeah, this is so true. And I'm getting so many questions cool, to sorry. this effect, uh, which is really interesting. So, on. let's have a look at some of them. Uh, one question. Uh, someone was saying the topic hasn't started yet. Um, so <laughs> this is what we're talking about, though, right? So if you want to beat the market, yeah. you need to think about what gives you the market return. Well, that's yes. an ETF, yes. right? You need to think about how you choose things that are going to grow faster yes. than the market. Yes. And this is the kind of stuff we're discussing. Right. Now, how do you beat the market? You beat the market by buying something the market doesn't value as highly as you think it should be. Mm. And you need to be right. Mm -hmm. The second bit is important, right? Because be, be, yes. being different and wrong is not going to make any money. Mm. You've got to be right. But mm. so, how do you beat the market? You beat the market by finding companies the market's wrong about. Mm. Now, that's both self evident, but mm. also really, really important to bring out. Because, by the way, on the path to market beating, mm. you're going to have to take a lot of hits because the market doesn't all of a sudden realize you're right straight away. Yeah. You know, if I buy, let's pick, um, kind of, I don't know, let's say, oh, it's a good example. I think something that's small, cheap, and I don't own. Um, <laughs> Uh, only because you know it's one of those. Um, what's all oh, it's correct. Okay, well, here's a question. There we go. Give me that. Uh, is Newix a buy now? Oh, is I was that gonna one? say, I always said <laughs> That's that's super. I want you to do it because it's super, super specific. Um, mm. but I will come oh, back to it. I was gonna say it's small and you might yeah, not own it. Yeah, no, let's no. go, let's go with Zip Pay, right? Let's mm. go with Zip Pay. So it's it's growing nicely, but it's still small relative to Afterpay. So it's it's small right now. Zip is very popular on Afterpay, by the way. I bet very highly traded as well. It's not necessarily buy and hold, right? So if if Zip is going to do well from here, if you believe it's going to do well. You have to believe the market isn't valuing the zip as for what it's eventually going to be worth, mm. right? So you have to believe it's undervalued. But then why would the market all of a sudden realize it's undervalued just because you bought it? Yeah. If the market thinks zip is worth X, it's going to think it's worth the same price tomorrow, the day after, the week after, the month after, because why would it change its mind? Yeah. Now, if you think you're right, you're saying, I've seen something the market's missing. Yes. And I'm going to hold it long enough until the market all of a sudden sees things the right way, in air quotes, <laughs> the way I see them. Yeah. Assuming I'm right but I might have to wait for that. And that might be a week or a month or a year or five years. Mm. Tesla, by the way, went nowhere mm. for five years. And then went up, was it like 70 fold in the space <laughs> of 12 months, yeah. right? So you had to sit through that while the market told you you were wrong over mm. and over and over and over again for mm. 60 straight months for 250 years, yeah. weeks, 50 years, weeks, <laughs> not years. Um, it was worth nothing in the 70s. <laughs> right, right. In the 70s, right. 70s you could, no one was into electric vehicles. You could, you could have bought Tesla for cents on the dollar. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but we had to wait five years of nothing, right? So mm -hmm. you've, got to, you've got to be right. You've got to wait for the market to come around to do your way of thinking, either because it changes its mind or because the results start to tell it mm -hmm. that you're right. And so beating the market means buying the right companies. And we talked a little yeah. bit about some of the, what some of those companies are. Um, they're going to be companies that are growing faster than you think or you know or you believe they're going to grow faster mm. than the market thinks yep. or aren't as risky as the market thinks or have a bigger market to your point about total addressable market mm. than the market thinks. So you have to find an area 
the, the boffins call it a variance perception. Mm. Something you see that others don't, and it's not yet reflected in the share price. That's the only way you do beat the market. Because if BHP is fairly valued right now and I buy it today, even if even if my valuation is right and it is fairly valued, mm. fairly valued by definition means you're going to get the market growth. And that's fine. Yeah. But you're not going to beat the market doing it. You've got to find stuff the market's wrong about. Yeah. And you have to be right. That combination is what gives you market beating performance. Okay. So we're getting quite a few questions. Do we go to Newark or no? <laughs> Let's save it for the end. Right, cool. We'll get some really specific All ones. Right, and good. I put Newix in there. So uh, to whomever <laughs> asked about um, <laughs> um I've, and the total addressable market fits in there. Oh, yeah. um, but Newix is one of the ones. So I'm going to take nice. down notes about a few others that people are really interested in. Um, and we'll save them to the end because I appreciate some people won't care about Newix. Okay. Um, and Redbubble is another one I've just seen oh, cool. and a few others. Yep. So we'll put them down. I'm not ignoring those questions. We'll just save them for the end because not everybody's going to have those stocks in mind. Nice, good call. So what I am getting a lot of questions about, mm -hmm. uh, or one is how do we identify future stars? So we'll talk yep. about that in a sec. But quite a few questions about value versus growth. Yeah, cool, great question. And also dividend paying stocks versus non-dividend paying okay. stocks. So we're talking about this idea of building a market beating yeah, portfolio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of us have learned about buying things that are mm -hmm. below their intrinsic value. Yes. But we we learned how to do that yep, yep. in a model of uh, a model of discounted cash flows. Yes, correct, correct. You yes. know, yep. the, the bad news, this kind of stuff. This idea it's just going to grow super fast yep. is, I want to say, relatively new. It's probably the last fifteen yep. years. Let's be yep. honest. Yep. Talk to me about that. How do you think about those sorts of things? Yeah. So new investors are in a good place in a way because they're not saddled with the stuff that we came into because I mentioned Coke before. Think about think about a steel mill, right? Mm. If you if you were a steel mill company, you started a steel mill in Sydney and then you wanted to expand to Adelaide. Well, you went and borrowed some money from the bank. You borrowed X tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. You spent 10 years building the steel mill. You got customers from the steel mill in Adelaide and you slowly over the next 10 years built up the some sort of scale, right? So between being successful in Sydney and then finally paying yourself back in Adelaide, it was 20 years. And that was one to two steel mills, right? Think about software as a service now from the internet. Mm. Think about the way these things grow. You build, Zero is a great example. You build a great bit of software, you sell as many times as you want. There's no replication cost. Mm. There's no distribution cost. The only cost is customer acquisition. So you can grow as fast as you can get customers. And that's a really, really different story. And that's where value, I started as a value investor myself, right? And I'm somewhere in between. <laughs> I feel like we all did. I, but the, we all did. And then we're all having thing. to kind of relearn <clears throat> yes. that the world has changed. Yes, yes. Now, I love the fact we're, we started as value because it gives you the foundation you need. Okay. But you've got to move forward from that because we were value investors when the question was, is it going to grow at 7% or 8%? Yeah. Was it going to go at 9% or 12%? Yeah. 12%, oh, let's not put that in, that's a bit too much. Yeah. These days we're in hyper growth land, right? And so you've got to be able to, I, I don't believe there's a difference between value and growth. I really fundamentally don't, right? Because the job of value investor is to put in that discounted cash flow model. Again, apologies for the algebra on the terms. Put in that model, the future growth expectations of the company. So there's no, you could do that with Amazon. Mm -hmm. You just had to get the numbers right. Mm. The problem is growth investors, generally speaking, have an allergy to large numbers in terms of growth. And growth investors, generally speaking, have an allergy to trying to work out what a business is fundamentally worth. But the mm. two can be combined really easily if you get the assumptions right, both ways. So you can put growth into value, value into growth. Mm. Um, Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's right-hand man, says value and growth are joined at the hip, and they are. Because because growth is a component of value. That's exactly what we do. We say $100 in profit today, how much does it grow into the future? What's that worth? Mm. Or put another way, a share price is, to use the vernacular, the future value of all its cash flows discounted back, which is what we call discounted cash flow, to the current day. So mm. if you could put Amazon's future in mm. 1997 on a spreadsheet, you could get to $3,000 if your assumptions were right. Now, you may not believe it. <laughs> and that's where, that's if where, and if that's you right. could get your assumptions And that's where value right. investors have a problem, right? Now, yes. on the flip side, a lot of growth investors come unstuck because they look at total addressable market. Remember when we were... A little bit older than you. When we were a little bit younger, the, the question they had all one percent of China it was almost a joke. Oh right? yeah, everyone would say, yeah. if I only get one percent of China, look how big we'd be. Yeah, and we'd all laugh and go, yeah, of course, but you can't get one. How do you get to one percent of China? Right, it's, yeah. it's incredibly hard. Except now you kind of can, or at least yeah. conceptually, the sort of We've online got some growth questions gets about us. Alibaba here there too. So online mm -hmm. growth gets us there, and so I, I think it's, I think it's, I, I think if you just value or just growth, you're missing the opportunity to learn from both. I think you want to be in the middle somewhere where you understand the fundamentals of, you know, not you can't just pay any price for any asset. Mm. Equally, trying to put 
being being too conservative with your assumptions mm. means you'll miss out on some of the biggest and best businesses of today and most importantly of tomorrow. Yeah, so if I speak about my own personal experience, being too conservative on the assumptions is is where I fail. Right. Um, and it, it makes it hard to let your winners run, which yes, is one of the things that you were talking yeah, about. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions was, how do you pick these afterpays and mm -hmm. these massive growth stories yeah. So you don't miss that first five years you talked yeah, about with Facebook. Yeah, yeah. And one of the biggest challenges, most of them are massively loss making to yeah, begin totally, with. Totally. And that's, you, how the hell do you do a discounted cash flow when it's negative? So you actually can. Okay. But 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 to do so, you have to make those great big assumptions. So it's yeah, really this hard. Is where right? you're so it's technically possible. Mm. And conceptually, it's kind of, that's what I mean, the, the process is not very, it's not useless because you can use the same mm. process. You just have to be able to extrapolate that far into the future and say, when Amazon turns a dollar, people have been telling me since $300 at Amazon wasn't worth anything because it didn't pay a dividend or right. you didn't have a profit, right? And okay. it ignored the fact that this business was going to get hundreds of millions of people as, mm. as customers mm. and to be able to monetize those in ways we couldn't even imagine. Mm. And so the value of the customer was worth something. And that's really, really important. Mm. Uh, back to the afterpay pit thing, and before I do actually a, a bit of a pre, a pre answer, Remember when we talk about portfolios, which is what we're here for, the, the idea of building a portfolio is not mm. picking 10 stocks that all go up, right? I mean, I'd love to, if we could, and I was say 10, we should have 20, <laughs> 25, but mm. you know, you're not going to pick 25 stocks that all go up. Yeah. You know, if you're looking for perfection, you are really going to struggle as an investor. Mm. If you want guaranteed 100% success rate, you're going to have to invest in cash and get half of 1%, right? You just, you can't make a fortune. You get that anymore. Well, that probably is that too. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean? So that like, you need to accept that losses and, and underperformance are part of the story. Peter Lynch, US fund manager in the 80s, again, I'm showing my age, said, if you're right six out of 10 times, you are good. And the reason is this, not just are you right six out of 10, therefore it's 60% and six is bigger than four, but the winners will almost always, if you do it well, be larger than the losers lose, if that makes sense, right? So the average gain <laughs> yeah. is probably larger than the average loss and there are more winners than losers Combine those together, that's how you get a market beating portfolio, right? So you accept they're going to be losers. Yep. You invest anyway. Yep. <laughs> you try to put the odds in your favour. And, and quite literally, that, that's think about private equity investors, right? They might get one or two out of 10. Mm. But they know if they pick a Facebook at, at PE stage, right? Yeah. At venture capital stage, they can lose a fortune on every other social network in the country mm. and still make an absolute squillion dollars. So as an investor, you've got to think probabilistically and you've got to think as a portfolio. Stop trying to be right all the time. Okay. Otherwise, you'll kind of frankly, worry yourself in an early grave, but also you'll end up with the most mediocre stocks because you're looking for absolute safety on a company level. Mm. Think of the portfolio level, not the company level. Really hard to do, really hard to get your head around. But when you do, it seriously will unlock a whole lot of opportunity for you as an investor because you'll say, you know what? It's okay that I lost money on, I'll pick a personal example, Coca-Cola Amateur, right? I sold that for a loss. Mm -hmm. Cool. But I made money on Kogan, on corporate travel management, a whole lot of others. Mm. That's the reality, right? So if I, and, and, be careful not to stop trying to lose money. So mm. if, if for me, I've made five times the money on corporate travel, right? Mm. I lost probably 30, 40% on Coke. Mm. Now, if the same process gets me both those stocks, mm. if I try too hard not to pick the next Coke, I miss out on the next corporate travel. Yeah. And so you've got to be really careful that you don't lock yourself out of the big winners by so desperately trying to avoid the losers. Mm. Again, think probabilistically as a portfolio and say, what combination of stocks Give me the best return, not not which individual stocks mm. give me the best return. And that's to your push about afterpay. I'm getting there, I promise. <laughs> um, which is, you know, if, if you want to buy some companies that are like afterpay, you're not sure about, hey, maybe, they, maybe it goes broke. Mm. Maybe it makes a fortune. Mm. As long as you're picking a diversified portfolio of companies mm. with those sort of attributes, for every loser, like a Newix right now down 75%, mm. or an afterpay up, what's it up? 12 times Depends since March. What day it is. Right, right. <laughs> So, yeah, but think about that. Like, if you lose all your money in New York, so let's say you lose everything in New York, it goes mm. broke tomorrow. No. If you're up 12 times on afterpay, mm. you stop, you stop 11 times overall. Yeah. So, so you know, the, the maths is, is if you get the big winners, particularly growth companies, mm. the maths is so overwhelmingly in your favor. Mm. It's worth taking those risks, not stupid risks, not thoughtless risks, not dumb risks. Just be thoughtful and say, you know what? I think afterpay is a winner, but if it loses, that's okay. I think Zip's a winner, but if it's a loser, that's okay. Mm. I think New York's is a winner, but yeah, it can. If you, you diversify properly, have enough companies in your portfolio and buy appropriately, mm. you really do put the odds in your favour of doing well. Okay. So let's talk about how many stocks, just excuse me for a sec, <clears throat> how many stocks mm. you need to get that. So with the story yep. of diversification, I find really interesting because mm -hmm. 
whenever you get the kind of top five things you need to mm -hmm. build a portfolio mm -hmm. to start building wealth, whatever, everyone's all about diversification. Don't put your eggs in one basket. Yep. I've been part of 10 billion marketing campaigns. So that's effectively <laughs> and there's a picture of an egg in a basket. That's nice. the thing. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so we all go with that. Right itself, yeah. And there's, yeah, it does. Um, and the imagery is quite easy too. Um, but there's also, there's a good amount of research about yeah. it. And it's been done across many different demographics and many different geographies to go. You do need a certain number of stocks mm -hmm. in your portfolio. What do you think that number is? <sighs> so this is really hard, right? Mm. There, there's, there, there is an easy academic answer, mm. but it misses the point for most people. So the answer generally they say is 20 to 25. Mm -hmm. Most academic literature, some you say 30, some you say 20. 20 to 25 is about the right number. There's also some that says ten, that and right? the um one. and and the twenty to sorry the ten to twenty yep. is sort of diminishing returns, yes. it's diminishing yes. benefits. Yes. So there's there's a group who say ten. Wow. Yeah. I I have big concerns about the yeah, ten. Just looking at the nav trade base, <laughs> yeah. Because of those ten yeah. in our top ten, five are banks. Right. So that was what I was going to say. Is <laughs> even if you have twenty and five are banks, yeah, that's a lot of diversification, right? Yeah. So <laughs> when, when people and the academic research assumes that no one ever says because and finishes mm -hmm. the sentence. The answer is 20, 20 to 25 if you chose at random. Right. Not, okay. not any 25 stocks. You can't mm -hmm. choose 25 lithium miners <laughs> and get the market return. You yeah. can't choose 25 financial services companies and get the market return. It's not going to happen, mm -hmm. right? So really, really important that the maths is if you grab a dartboard, you throw 25 darts, you get the market return roughly, mm -hmm. right? But if you choose specifically any 25 stocks under a certain circumstance, you're not necessarily going to get the market return and have that diversification benefit. So when you're diversifying, I would say 20, 25 stocks, absolutely. Okay. Second thing I'd say is think about not just the industry or the sector, mm -hmm. but the type of risk you're taking, right? So if I have 25 stocks that are all discretionary retailers or travel stocks or um, similar companies that all rely on consumer sentiment, mm. which actually are in different sectors isn't even enough because mm. the risk level, the risk factor, is consumer spending. Mm. Similarly, if I had uh, 25 companies that are all exposed to interest rate risk, even if they're in 10 different industries, the risk factor isn't the industry necessarily, it's part of it, but it's what is what is the thing that might happen that would impact these companies. If this thing happened, if the risk factor came to pass, if it was the dollar went down, mm. interest rates went up, mm. interest rates went down, um, consumer sentiment went up, business investment, whatever those things are, whatever those risk factors are, don't think about which you know, it's not I own X percent of banks or X percent of miners or X percent of consumer discretionary stocks, but what factors in the broader economy could impact my businesses and how many, what proportion of those will be hit? If consumer sentiment falls and all your companies suffer, guess what? You're not diversified. No matter how many companies you've got, how many sectors, that's the issue. So think about the types of impacts that can either increase or decrease your portfolio's value. Mm -hmm. And if they're overweighted in one or two areas, then you're probably not diversified enough, even if you've got 20 or 25 companies. Okay, so we're getting a lot of questions, Excellent. a lot of questions um, about sectors yes, and what we might call tilts in the portfolio. Nice. So you've talked about 20 to 25 stocks. Yes. We talk about not having half of them in banks or yes. whatever it might be. Yes. Um, you'd be pushed. Again. Miners, biotechs, whatever, yeah. Whatever yeah. your thing might be. I mean, I do know people who only specialise in small cap miners, for yep. example, yep. and that's yep. the yep. thing. I think if you want to play that game, mm -hmm. you have unique expertise in that area. Yes. Good luck to you. I certainly don't. Yeah. Um, and but, you, you know, need to realise that you're taking an extraordinary amount of risk, which may well pay off. Yeah. But know the game you're playing is really, really important. I, I do find with those sorts of people, they do tend to know. Yeah. Right? They're right. fully aware. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I find biotech really funny because my father is a, is a geneticist by trade okay. and is in biotechnology. Uh, and where he tells me the best technology is is mm -hmm. often not the best stock. And that's really I think because too. a lot of analysts have no idea what the best technology mm -hmm. is, and but it also tells you a lot about the marketing and the yes, yes. take to market and all that kind of stuff. So it also tells you though, by the way, that the best tech doesn't always make the best returns. Yeah. Right. So that that's just fundamentally. So I'm gonna I'm gonna you ready for the comments of blog? I'm gonna mention Bitcoin. Get me <laughs> so um, we did get this question. Here we go. Tell me about crypto. What I what Didn't I will say. To get to what I will say is I want I want. I talk about crypto if you want, I'll talk about a particular part of it, which is most crypto fans are techies who yeah, get yeah. the technology, yeah. right? And that's really cool. Mm. Technology is wonderful. It doesn't make it a good business or a good business case, yeah. right? So that's the difference. I'm not saying it is or isn't. We can have that discussion later. Mm. All I'm saying is just because you understand it really, really well, yeah. doesn't really give you an edge in, am I going to make money out of it? Can it be commercialized? Yeah. You know, those things, it, it, Betamax, right? 
was mm-hmm. a better you know, young kids. Just trust me on this. No one, one has any th- idea. What there was a thing called video back in the day, yeah. way before streaming and Netflix, and before the VCR that you may have seen because yeah, right. your parents haven't cleaned out their garage. Correct. Uh, there was so, a thing so called Betamax. There's the which old thing. Different there's one. the VHS in your in your cupboard. Exactly. That that's that was one video format. I couldn't mm-hmm. get a better format than I'm getting. Old. You're gonna have to get so it. VHS and Betamax, right? Two formats. Um, what was, is there a, is there a new version of that? There's kind of format wars. Not really. Remember high definition DVD and Blu-ray DVD. Is that yeah, I don't know. Anyway. Oh, there was MySpace and then it was replaced by Facebook. There you yeah. go. But even that. that is like way, way too old for most I know, of I know. Uh, Snapchat and Instagram or something. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's, let's try and go back to track. So there are two video formats, right? By all reports, if you ask anybody in the industry, the Betamax technology, mm. video technology was much better than VHS, mm. right? So if you would have asked people back then, yeah, if you ask technologists, right, mm. which technology should I invest in, they would mm. say, Betamax is better, hands you've got to buy a Betamax. It's just so much better. Buy it, buy it, because it's great. And they would have gone and filled their cupboards with Betamax and they would have bought Betamax shares and all that kind of great stuff. It didn't win the format wars, right? Because of a whole lot of other reasons, which actually include adult movies, which we're not going to get yeah, into. I was going to say, you know the reason yeah, for that. Yeah, I it's do not, know that. Yeah, exactly. It's not appropriate for this forum. And don't Google that at work. <laughs> yeah. So, so. But the take to market strategy was much more it effective. It worked, right? So that's, but that's the thing. So it actually was the inferior technology. Yeah. That actually succeeded not because of technological reasons. So just if you get the technology, if you know, to, yeah. your, to your father's point, that the technology is better, that's not that enough. That's it not doesn't. enough. You've got to look at the business case as well. Okay. So let's talk about the business case because people are asking about sectors, right? Cool. So, and I'm sort of bringing in all the different sectors people are asking about. So there's questions about uh, various uh, opportunities in China. So mm-hmm. how much we should be focusing on. Yep. So there's big questions about Fortescue, yes. Rio, BHP. Yes. Are we at the end of, uh, I guess, there's been talk about a super cycle. Mm-hmm. Recently did a podcast with our resources analyst on okay. it. All that kind of stuff. Very interesting. But he he's effectively saying iron ore price has absolutely peaked. It'll start to fall. So should we be thinking about, I agree. All right, we'll throw that in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's quick, a quick, quick answer. On that one. Iron ore currently, gross margins on iron ore are higher than gross margins on software. Mm. If that doesn't blow your mind, nothing will. It yeah. can't be sustained over any length right. of time. I don't know when, I don't know how far, I don't know how fast. Yeah. You're not going to make 90% we'll gross to. margins on iron ore. Yeah. Okay. Um, Treasury is predicting $55 a ton, and yes. that's currently well smart. over 150, yep. right? So, so there's questions about iron ore uh, and mining in general. Mm-hmm. Questions about lithium. Now, yes. there's more questions about battery technology and renewables Love and it. so on. Yep. There are questions about China and whether mm-hmm. or not we should be focusing on China with respect to A2 milk and so on. I'm throwing I, uh, them all... cancel my rest of my day? On the, <laughs> that, that what we're doing the here reason with? I'm throwing <laughs> them all in together yeah. is they indicate effectively tilts where you go, yeah, I it. see a sector opportunity yep. and then I need to think about what stocks are in that sector. Yes. So is that how you approach things? And, and from a fund manager's perspective, they would call it top down, mm-hmm. right? Top down, I see renewables as the greatest opportunity yeah. of all time. And then yeah. I'm going to try to pick winners in that mm-hmm. area. Mm-hmm. Or do you go, I've seen a little company, it looks amazing. And that's what I'm going to focus on. Yes. Excellent. Right. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, am, I absolutely am bottom up as okay. a starting point. Yeah. However, the things that you often say, so again, pattern recognition I mentioned before, mm-hmm. when you start to see something that seems like an opportunity that may apply to other companies as well, almost, almost inadvertently, you end up kind of feeling a bit thematic. So mm. China's a great example, right? So mm. for example, I think Australian products in China will continue to burn once we sort this geopolitical mess out with China. And Mr. Morrison, if you're watching, little, could, tiny you, please, could you please fix that for me? Yeah, that'd be yeah. great. So... It, it, it will, it will, I, 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 my belief is no guarantees, no promises. And I don't know anything you don't know. Um, China will continue to buy Australian products once we get through this mess. If that's right, think about the likes of A2 Milk. I own A2 Milk shares. Blackmore's own Blackmore shares. So I'm eating my own cooking here. Um, Bellamy's, which is now long, no longer listed. Um, Treasury will continue to well own Treasury shares. And again, not for, not only for that reason. You've but actually not, answered not, a lot of questions right then, so that's right. Great. So, so but, but not but not top down, right? Not because I'm saying, hey, China's gonna be huge. Which companies can I buy? I look at something like a Blackmore's or A2 or a Treasury, and I just think, hang on, they've been beaten down because they're now out of China or struggling to get into China because the suitcase trade, the Daigu trade, isn't in Australia because Chinese tourists and students aren't coming to Australia right now. Hmm. And so the prices, I, I talked before about the variant perception, right? The market is effectively pricing in business as usual from this point, no change. Mm-hmm. If that happens, I think the shares are probably reasonably priced, generally speaking. If China's consumption, China's demand, China's exports, China's Daigu suitcase trade, China's import directly pick back up again, 
then I think there's upside. And so if you look at that now, again, these will happen a bit. So I'm not, I'm not thematically saying, hey, which China stocks can I, which China exposed stocks can I buy? Mm. But I'm looking at all these businesses saying they got great businesses, great brands, great products. People love them. There's a temporary disruption. It happens to fit in the same basket. So is that thematic? Kind of you can say, well, if, if I gave you those three stocks to tell me what's in favor, you say, oh, it's obviously a thematic play on China. Yeah. It kind of is, but almost by by um, result, not by intent. And so sometimes I do end up with, you know, a retail similar example, right? We looked at Share Advisor at Motley Fool in kind of May, June, July last year specifically. And retail still beaten down because I absolutely had faith that the market would recover, the economy would recover. And so stocks that are thrown out with the bathwater, mm. they kind of, you know, car sales was always going to come back. You know, and so you might have had to wait. It might have gone down before it went back up again. But if you if you believe that car sales are going to recover, mm. the retail tr- sales are going to recover, the travel is going to recover, when they're offering you a discount, great time to go and buy. So that's an interesting one because we all sort of assume travel would have recovered by now. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And that's, there's two elements to this. So yeah. you were talking about having the confidence to wait it out and going, yeah. I bought it for a reason. Yeah. I believe it's going to come back. But a lot of people... I guess, priced in that return mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 12 months yes, ago, yes, yes. Uh, assuming that we'd be back yep. in the air and so yep. on, that we wouldn't be locking down poor Melbourne. Oh, I'm really sorry. Yeah. Um, it's a rough it's year awful. for you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and yet mm-hmm. here we are. Yeah. So when your assumptions turn out to be very premature yes. or that things have not changed as quickly as you would hope, yes. do you rethink? Yes and no. So yes, you should always be, you should never stick to an idea just because you had it in the past, right? Okay. Just because you thought it was true then doesn't mean you should assume it's necessarily true now. On the flip side, don't sell out out of impatience, frustration, disappointment, fear, panic, you know, um, just, just whatever, right? So it's tempting to kind of say, I thought it'd be fixed by now. Therefore, I'm saying, take Treasury wine estates, right? I bought those shares at a higher price and I bought some at a lower price. Mm. I thought, I didn't think China would be as big a deal as it has become. Mm. So I, I was premature on one level, buying mm. too early. Okay. On the flip side, if I think the shares have probably got an upside, back to normal, like if China mm. goes back to normal, mm. there's probably an upside of maybe 70 or 80%. Now, if I have to wait five years for that, for that mm. 80%, that's going to be the best compound that in the back of my head. That's probably like 10% a year. So if I have to wait five years, I'm going to get roughly a market average return. Mm. If there's anything less than five years, I'm going to make money. I'm going to beat the market. So I'm intrinsically making a bet to say, okay, I think it'll be in less than five years. Um, and if, if I'm right, then I'll make some money. But just because it hasn't happened yet, I mentioned Tesla before, right? Mm. How, if we replay that same question over the Tesla shares, mm. at any point in that five-year period before they took off, you could have said, oh, I thought it was going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. Okay, I'll time to sell. Mm. That would have been a colossal, like a super expensive mistake, right? Mm. So just because it hasn't happened yet, yeah. doesn't mean you should give up. It doesn't mean, by the way, you should just hold on blindly, yeah. always reassess your, your, your thesis and say, hang on, hasn't happened yet. Is that because it's not going to mm. or just because it hasn't happened yet? And if the answer is still, I believe in the thesis, I think it's going to likely to happen. I don't know when, but I'll wait for it. Then hang on by all means. If you look at it again and go, oh, you know what? What needed to happen was this and this and this. Then I'm in trouble. I made the wrong call. Then it's time to abandon hope, move on to something with a better idea, a better chance of succeeding. But just make sure you're patient. Really important. Okay, so sorry, there's just so many questions, so That's I do awesome. apologize right. for having trouble getting through them all. I'll try, I'll try and to get my um, answer shorter, shall I? And I'm no, no, no. It's like we would be here for a couple of hours, but um, <laughs> we are. Someone's talked about Blu-ray. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for answering. Someone answer. knows. Someone know. knows. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, we're talking about these sectors. Yep. So you start bottom up. Yes. Great. Yes. Uh, and I might ask you in a moment Definitely. how you find the ideas mm-hmm. that give you the bottom up. But right. if you are looking mm-hmm. at major thematics, what excites you? Oh, so I'm not generally, as I said, but if I mm-hmm. was looking at them, um, from with thematics, I'll give you the problem. I'll give, I will give you the answer. I'll try and give you the okay. answer. From with thematics is even if the theme's right, there may not be any opportunity. We mentioned Bitcoin before. Yeah. I, my favorite example, you've heard me banging about this before, Gemma, I'm sure it's airlines, right? Yeah. If, if, if you'd have told me in 1970, that air travel was going to go up 10,000 times, so it's number of flights per day, week, year, mm. I would have sold everything, mortgaged my house and bought airline stocks, right? Because mm. airline stocks, airlines, if travel goes through the roof, I'm going to make a fortune. Now, you and I both know, and most of our viewers will know, mm. that in the following 50 years, most airlines went broke two or three times, right? <laughs> yeah. So the trend, not was, profitable. the trend was real. Mm. Yeah, you were, you were absolutely spot on about the trend. Air travel go through the roof, and you still didn't make any money. Yeah, and so nice. there's a difference between the theme, which is, I see this thing happening in future yeah. and the economic results you can get as an investor. 
Yeah. And that's the risk. So for example, I'll give you another counter example before I go back to the what. I worry about lithium right now and we have questions about that. Okay, we've got heaps here's, of questions about here's that. What, so here's what concerns me. I think lithium sales go through the roof. Mm -hmm. I think lithium volumes go through the roof. Electric vehicles are going to be real we'll with grid storage, probably with batteries. That goes through the roof, right? Huge increase in demand. Mm -hmm. You know what else went through, went through the roof in the last century? Oil use. Mm -hmm. You know how much oil went up during the last century? About the rate of inflation. Yeah, wow. So again, you got the idea right. You got the trend right. You know why? Because they found a lot more oil. People were incentivized to go and find more oil because it was expensive and worth digging up or, or drilling for. Unless the lithium supply is constrained permanently, mm. there's no reason, or, or we can't literally find enough of it. Yeah. If the demand goes up, the price goes up, what happens when the price goes up? It incentivizes people to go and look for more lithium. Mm. They find it, what happens? The price comes back down. Right. And so commo that's what commodities do. Mm. That's why the iron ore price will come down, I'm reasonably sure. So the oil price went up roughly inflation over a century, despite the fact that, and again, imagine how much oil use and consumption has expanded over the last century, right? Hugely. But we haven't made any money out of it because we found more of it. And yeah. so that's the risk with lithium. Even if you get the trend right now, I might be wrong on that, by the way. I'm not, mm. I have no delusions of grandeur. Right? I'll be wrong on a lot of stuff over the next 25 years. But if I start from saying, I think lithium demand goes up, I think that's absolutely right. I think electric vehicles go up. That's absolutely right. I think we'll find more lithium. Mm. I think we'll extract more of it. I think the cost will go down. Mm -hmm. So don't bet on a trend in volume necessarily right. replicating into a trend in profits and in share prices. I'd be very wary of that one. Back to your question. I think you want to be looking at businesses with large total addressable markets to your point. I think mm -hmm. B2B software is going to be a big area. I think software as a service is a subset of that, super, super valuable. I think consumer e-commerce is going to remain really, really strong. The uptake of e-commerce is still continuing. We're only at 15% back in January of 2020. We're about a 30% now penetration. That's a big, big market in terms of penetration. And then multiply that by the amount of stuff each of us buy. So I buy some stuff online. I'll buy a whole lot more online. And someone else who hasn't bought anything online yet will start doing that. Multiply that out over multiple years. I think e-commerce is a huge opportunity still getting started. Despite the groans of Amazon, um, I think it's going to do fantastic well for a very long time to come. So I think that's really, really important. Um, I think infrastructure is interesting for income investors. I don't expect it to be market beating, and that's not what we're here for necessarily. Different, whole different webinar. We are getting a lot of questions from more mature investors with self-managed super funds and so cool. on. And the challenge of having a market beating portfolio in retirement yep. is you're not that fussed Correct. about taking a lot of risk. You really want that return to come through. So I think we'll come back for a different webinar on that one. You're okay. not going to beat the market, I don't think, with income portfolio. And I don't think you should worry about that, by the way. There are two ways of dealing with income in retirement. One is buy the best portfolio you can and sell off small parts of it. The other is invest specifically for income. We have a service, by the way, that does that. I'm not here for an ad, but we do that. Mm -hmm. And we actually don't have a, the only service at Motley Fool Australia that doesn't have a market beating mandate because we're mm -hmm. there to provide quality income, franking credits and moderate capital growth. Right. That's, that's a retirement strategy, right? Which is completely fine. Yeah. You'll very you'll do very, very, very well. I mean, that in a sense, it would be very hard to mm. beat the market with an income strategy. Just, it's just really, really difficult. And that's yeah. I don't think you should worry about that at that point, right? Yeah. But different, there's different a thing things. called sequencing risk, which matters a lot yes, in retirement, correct. which yeah. basically means when you retire, the very worst thing that can happen to you is a market fall yes. straight after you retire because you don't have the ability to correct. make that return back again. Assuming so, you need the capital, by the way, the whole lot of... We, we need to come back and do another one of these on this one. Because yeah. you're right, you're right, mm -hmm. but only if you need to sell any capital. So yes, if you, if you sorry, can tie on the income from exactly, that exactly that's right. Yes. So the sequence we said, as you say, about when the capital needs to be drawn down versus the income you're drawing from, say, dividends, for example, and or frank credits or distributions. So yeah, that, that, that matters a heap. And the way you, way you sequence that's really important. I agree. So we have seven <laughs> minutes left. All right, let's do it. Let's think about seven the most important. Seven minutes of power. So one thing yes. that has come up all the way through this, and I haven't been specific about asking you, yes. we've been talking about portfolios and mm -hmm. stocks in general yep. you've mentioned facebook and amazon but we've yes. been mostly talking about australia yes. let's talk about how you think about a domestic portfolio and an international portfolio so one of the okay. things about nab trade that a lot of our investors do love is you can buy international directly u.s uh so u.s germany uk and hong kong to be frank 90 percent of it's in the Trinity. u.s yep. because that's what people want yep. um although we see more in hong kong now because people can buy oh, 10 cents point. on yeah, there so we do see other companies come in mm -hmm. um london for anyone who's interested uh the uk is very heavy on resources it which is. you wouldn't anticipate they don't exactly have mm -hmm. a massive sort of western australia size kind yeah, of iron yeah. or uh 
but it's a great place to list them. So Energy in particular as well, yeah. Yeah, heaps yeah. of that stuff, but then we don't see a lot of buying in that. So you can buy direct international stocks yes. or alternatively you can buy ETFs yes. and listed portfolios and we see both from our investors. But we're getting a lot of questions, right? Cool. Should I be buying how much okay. international? What are the things I should be considering and so on? And how do I mix that with an Australian portfolio? In seven minutes. All right, here we go. Should yeah. you be buying? Yes, absolutely. Should you be buying international uh, direct or ETFs? Yes. Either, <laughs> either or both. I own both. I own direct US shares and I own a NASDAQ ETF and an S&P 500 ETF. Okay. So there you go. Both is, is perfectly fine. Um, I think you should be going there because we're 2% of the world's equity markets, right? The chance that the best business in the world happened to be in Australia by choice. It's like if you're going to buy a property, right? I said to you, Gemma, you can go and buy yourself a house. You can only look in suburbs study with me. You say, well, why would I do that? Mm. Exactly. That's the point, right? Mm. So if you're only buying in Australia, mm. you're only buying shares that list on the ASX. Now, we might, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we've actually been the best performing market over more than 100 years, right? So, mm. but not by much. Yeah. Even if we want to beat the market, mm. what are the odds that the best performing companies are only in Australia? Literally zero, right? The next 10 years. Lit, but, yeah. but even general, lit, even over the last 100 years, mm. the best market was Australia. But yeah. If you wanted to beat that market, couldn't you have found, again, let's go back in the day, General Electric, General Motors, Ford, yeah. um, Nike, um, and then more recently, Amazon, Google, Facebook. Right? These are market-beating companies. Mm. Yes, there were some Australian market-beating companies. They're fantastic. But 90% of the market is outside Australia. Mm. We, you should be at least, at least, at least. Look, your point about sequencing risk is actually a really important one. It came at the right time because... I think the more time you got to retirement, the more international exposure you should have. The reason I would be reducing it slowly as you got to retirement age if you need to withdraw the capital is because you've got only the timing risk of the share prices, but also currency. So mm. I wouldn't avoid it at all. I would just be mindful you need a longer lead time because if you need to sell some shares tomorrow and the dollar, the Australian dollar is buying $1.20 US, that's a terrible time to bring your money back to Australia, right? Mm. Terrible. If it's buying 50 cents, then sell your American shares rather than your Australian shares. So mm. the timing, the opportunity matters on currency, but you need a longer horizon mm. to sell. But yes, absolutely invest in the US either directly or via an ETF. Either is completely fine. You're ETFs get you there. You're saying the US. Yes. So, not all global markets? Because yeah, quite a few quite, of the questions no, have come through about particularly the big Chinese tech companies. Yes. It'll always be about Alibaba and Tencent yes. and so on. And Barbara Tencent and Baidu mm -hmm. have been in our top 10 international companies at various points in time. So I say US specifically, um, and probably actually as a shortcut, so you're right to call me up on it, mm -hmm. but most of those companies are available as American depository receipts. Yes, they are. So you can actually buy them on the US market, yep. even though you're buying international ex-US companies. Yes. So I use US probably as a, as a proxy for international. Okay. Again, remembering, of course, that more than half of the S&P 500 revenue is now earned outside of America. Okay. So when you're buying American companies, you're really buying global companies for the most part. Think about, again, Google, Facebook, Amazon, again, that, that group, right? Yeah. So much of that is revenue out of South Korea and Finland and New Zealand and Vietnam. And yeah. So you're getting international exposure anyway. But yes, you're right. International generally, um, I, th I think most people should focus on the US first because that's where the best companies are likely to be. And frankly, as Westerners, as from talking for myself, I'll have people watching who aren't uh, from mm. a Western background, which is they've got a great advantage, right? Because mm. I don't know Chinese companies anywhere near as well as I could. I don't mm. know Indian companies anywhere. I've got a cultural barrier, I've got a language barrier, I've got a, a, a background barrier. Mm. If you have that exposure and that 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 insight, yeah. then you're in a much better position than I am. Mm. So go for it. By all means, do it. Um, but, but given we know the US is well regulated, the markets are generally pretty widely open and pretty effective and efficient. Yeah. Um, it's a good place to start your international exposure. As mm -hmm. I said, by at least by at least by an international ETF. Um, there's a Vanguard All World ETF, which is a great starting point if you just want just one, a one-click total developed world, great mm -hmm. way to go. But then start looking internationally for direct shares as well. So an all world ETF is about 60% US. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so right. you're yeah, getting yeah, yeah. Uh, and until fairly recently, and you do need to check the underlying exposure. And honestly, there's a PDF, pop yeah. it up and it'll show you like a chart really that cool. shows you what's in. Um it's like eleven percent China. Yeah. But to your point, mm -hmm. if you're buying Barber and so on in the US, Correct. then you're getting exposure. So US listed versus US business. Yes. Very um I want to say Young Brands that owns KFC. Yeah. More of the business, I think, is in China than the US, for example. But it's a yeah. US company for all intents and purposes as, a, as an investor, mm. but you're effectively getting Chinese, specifically in Asian, more broadly exposure with fruits and businesses like Young, for example. If you're trying to buy luxury brands, if you want to buy Louis Vuitton, Mert, Hennessy, and these <laughs> sorts of guys and caring and so on, believe me, they make most of their profits outside Europe. Um, so it's quite interesting yeah, to look totally. at some of those as well, how mm -hmm. they how they've position themselves yeah. we have one minute oh, left. No, didn't oh, up, did i i know uh, 
final thought yes. for investors at this point in time. So it's a really interesting time for investors. We yes. have new investors who have seen the most extraordinary gains ever. Yeah, and remarkable. And are either thinking it should always be like this or horrified <laughs> that the next 10 years are going to be terrible because yeah, yeah, yeah. how do you ever do this well yeah, again? Yeah, yeah. And then we have others who've been around a long time. So yeah. you and I have seen several market downturns yes. and we're kind of roll with the punch of the bit. <laughs> but it's thoughts. Okay. Um, this too shall pass. Yes. Whether it's good or bad, this too mm -hmm. shall pass. If you've done really well the last 12 months, you've done really well, but you're really vulnerable right now because when things start going badly, you feel like you've lost your knack, that all of a sudden the market's going against you. Some investors are better off actually having losses up front rather than gains, right? Because you feel yeah. the pain early and then you get to sense, then you make some gains, but you can put those in context. Yeah. If all you've done is win over the last 12 months, you've done spectacularly well. I wish I'd started then too. I told me all. <laughs> but, but when you start, so Afterpay's fallen from 140 to 90 ish. 60, yeah. There you go. Mm. So you're, if you've bought those, you're like, oh, look at all this money I've lost. This is normal. That is normal, right? Get used to it. It's going to happen a million times over your investing career. So this too shall pass. Be patient. Be optimistic. The market does recover. We hit an all-time high only yesterday. We're recording this on, on the 1st of June. Only yesterday, all-time high. Who was telling you to invest 12, 18 months ago? If they weren't, they were doing you a massive disservice. Keep investing. Keep investing regularly. Add money regularly to the market. Don't just look at the headlines of top to top. If you're investing through the downturn as well, you've done really, really, really well. So be optimistic. Look forward. Be diversified, please. And just stay the course. It is really... I, here's my, my go-to mantra. I'd rather get rich slowly than go broke quickly. So, <laughs> so stay the course. It is absolutely worth it, I promise you. That's beautiful. Thank you. So, guys, I have to apologise. We've got something like 100 questions, which wow. is pretty difficult to get through in an hour. Uh, pretty <laughs> difficult. We did our best. Even the pace um, I talk. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you've learned over years. <laughs> Scott, hopefully you will come back and join us again. I would it love would to, Gemma. Fantastic. We might see if we can get as many of you as possible submitting questions in advance so we can kind of yeah. pace out how many we can get through. <laughs> so I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question. Hopefully we'll get another opportunity. That'd be great. Tell people how they can track what you're doing and follow all your fascinating stuff. Oh, I do read kind. Scott's stuff, by the way, and it's really good, which is why he's here. <laughs> you're very kind. Thank you, Gemma. <laughs> uh, fool.com.au is our website. You can sign up to our Take Stock newsletter, which sends you some of my regular emails. Plus some marketing, really, really clear. I'm not going to mislead anyone. We send marketing to that mailing list as well. Um, jump on social media, TMF Scott P on Instagram and Twitter. That's TMF Scott P. And Scott Phillips Money on Facebook. All the stuff I write is posted there as well. So you can get that there as well as the mailing list. But um, whatever works for you. Beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us today. We do really appreciate it. As I said, thank you so much for submitting so many questions. It's amazing. Fantastic. And um, we did our best to get to them. We won't always quite get through all, but it was fabulous. We will prepare another one of these, which will be fabulous. Awesome. And you'll also get a recorded copy of this if you didn't manage to, uh, to make it to the whole thing. So thanks so much for joining us. See ya.